Recorders on. This is Dr. Jenny Tefankian from drjennytefankian.com, and you are listening to Room Room Veer with Jeff Smith, reminding you how to activate the power to heal inside your own body. See, that was pretty damn good. Okay. Did you like it? I'm fine with it. Yeah, I love it. Okay. Okay, okay great. Let's, let's do it. Do it. Let's, let's hit stop. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> Are you ready to thoughtfully steer away from your revved up, frenzied, and far too often scripted life? Then welcome to Vroom Vroom Veer with Jeff Smith, where he guides you down the road differently traveled by sharing unique experiences with guests who have managed to shift away from a life stuck on cruise control and veered their way into a more authentic and fulfilling one in all sorts of interesting and kind of remarkable ways. Get ready to Vroom Vroom Veer with your differently traveled road chauffeur, Jeff Smith. Dr. Ashley Smith. Thank you for being on Vroom Vroom Veer and welcome to the show. Look at that. I got it all out. How's it going? Good. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I think we're going to have such a fun conversation. I think you're right. I think this is going to be a good time. Um, so, okay. So you are at drashleysmith.com. Did I get that right? You did. Yep. Drashleysmith.com okay. and also peakmindpsychology.com. Excellent. So talk a little mm -hmm. bit about what you're most excited about in your business today. Yeah. So I'm a licensed psychologist by right. uh, trade and training, and I specialize in anxiety disorders. So I wear a couple of different hats. I have a small private practice, I'm not taking any new patients. So that's a very small part of it. Okay. Uh, I also do a lot of speaking and writing. So my position at Peak Mind and the co-founder there, along with my partner, Dr. April Seifert, and we met way back in grad school, half a lifetime ago. And have been friends. And then we created Peak Mind with this shared really passion of wanting to take what we know from the field of psychology and make it more accessible. Right. Right, okay. right now, psychologists, it's, it's if you go to therapy, you get access to it. Or if you're an academic and you read these really obscure, nerdy journals that no one else reads. <laughs> right. Right. Well, otherwise, we know all of this stuff you know, from the field of psychology about how to live a good life, how to perform at your peak, how to be happy, how to be confident. Yeah. And no one's getting access to it. So, so that's where Peak Mind right. uh, was born, was this, this goal of let's get this information, these tools and techniques into everybody's hands. Nice. So through Peak, we partner with organizations and businesses to provide trainings and uh, workshops, speaking events for employees and leaders. So okay. basically, that's a huge part of what I do. And then I do a little speaking on my own as Dr. Ashley, just partly my story and blending psychology with lived experience to help people really understand here's how to live a good life, regardless of what life throws at you. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a huge lesson that I yeah. think I just recently learned. Like I was telling yeah, you, I think yeah. it's, it, it's, like it's one that I keep Regardless of your yeah. life situation, like the mm -hmm. world is like weather, right? If you think about it, right? It's like the world is Absolutely. out. Like you go back to like ancient Rome or ancient Greece. They're mm -hmm. talking about the same stuff. It's like, uh, people suck, you know? <laughs> yeah. I've got bills and my, my employees aren't doing their jobs and, you know, my, my family stinks. You know, it's all the same. You know? Absolutely. And and stuff is going to happen, right? Like right. inevitably at a minimum, you're going to get some sort of diagnosis or you're going to get old, right? Something totally. you're quote unquote, get, bad is yes. going to happen. Totally. And it's really about how you deal with things that right. makes the difference. It's not totally. so much what happens to you. No. And that's contrary to what a lot of people think. And right, so I'm right. very passionate about saying, here's how your mind works. It's kind of a jerk. And it is not it, <laughs> kind of if it yeah. is right. Like it's, it's, totally it's designed to yeah. keep you alive, but right, it's right. not designed to make you happy. Right. And if you know a little bit of this stuff, here are the things that you can do to live a bold, happy life. Right. Regardless of what happens to you. And I think that's so important. And so I do that. That's an important message for writing. everybody to get that. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. Especially like if, because if you stay there, like I know, mm -hmm. I was depressed. I had suicide attempts in my past, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. believing that voice in your brain Bingo. a little too much. It's Bingo. like taking it seriously, believing it, going, yeah. oh, well. But that's it's, it's not, something that most people don't know that you don't have to, right? Right. It's, it's, right. Like it, it's right, not right, right. fact. It's just it's, it's, a, con it's, just it's your a construct. Mind. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. They're not even like. UFOs 
or entities on another plane. No, it's nope. just your brain. <laughs> it, it, right? But that, you know, I tell people all the time, I'm like, you know what? Your stomach growls and you don't say, I am growling. You say my stomach growls, right? right? And if your heart rate goes up, you don't say I am pounding. You say my heart is pounding. Yeah. You know, stomachs growl, hearts pound, minds think. Yes. That's what they do. And yet when they our talk. mind starts thinking. They judge, we, they compare. Yes. Bingo. Yes. And we take it as like, us. And it's like, no, 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 that's just your mind doing what minds do. It's like yeah. mental stomach growling. You don't have to listen to it. Sometimes right, right. you do, right? but sometimes you don't. Hey, and when look, you know sometimes that, there's like that mm -hmm. quiet, that still quiet mind, or that still quiet voice that you get after mm -hmm. a mindfulness practice or sure. like when you wake up at three o'clock in the morning and you don't really have mm -hmm. anything to do. <laughs> yeah. Some, but it, that sometimes takes... you get really good thoughts, you know? Yeah. But it can't, not always. I think the, yeah. No. And the, I think the skill comes in being able to be aware of what you're thinking and then right. being able to choose which ones to listen sound to, which ones true. to act yeah. on, which ones mm -hmm. sound good. Does it, yeah. sound, you know, think about it. Like, does that sound like good advice? You know, would Mr. Rogers it, give me this advice? <laughs> I love that so much because so many people are so critical of themselves. Right. And right. I'm like, well, we have an inner critic voice inside Yeah. just because it's there, just because it's loud doesn't mean it's right, right. or true. It's right. just a habit. It's yeah, like yeah. a mental habit. Yeah. I love that. What would Mr. Rogers tell you? <laughs> <laughs> I just if was listening to uh, Joe Rogan's podcast again, mm -hmm. and he was saying like, just because there's a voice in your head doesn't mean it's any smarter than any other idiot. You know, that's true. Right. I mean, yeah. even if it is an alien or an entity or, you know, whatever, you know, doesn't make it smarter than some dude on the street. <laughs> no, absolutely. And then the right. real thing, like we have lots of voices in our head, right? Totally. Not like a, do you hear voices, but we have lots of voices we have in lots there. Of and voices in our head. Yes. The yes. ones that show up unbidden. So uninvited, unintentionally are ones right. that are kind of our default programming. So yep. these were voices that got created before we became an adult and could really evaluate. Yeah, this is helpful. Or I want to listen to it. So I think about it like programming. Totally. And it's the negative ones. It's the biased ones. It, that that quiet wisdom that you're talking about, that one has to be invited. You have to really yeah. work to yeah, bring yeah, yeah. that one right, to the party. Right. Totally. Yes. And a lot of people don't and yeah. or don't even know that that has to happen. And so that, right. I mean, it's that's too what noisy I'm in there. About. It's too noisy mm -hmm. in there. <laughs> Absolutely. That's the, mind, the, the mindfulness piece. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So let's go back in time. Because okay. you were not always Dr. Ashley. No. You used to be Ashley and little Ashley. So, yeah. So let's let's talk about like I, like I always I've been like adjusting here. So mm -hmm. when you were in high school mm -hmm. and you were thinking about what is the future hold for Ashley. Mm -hmm. So were you on the college prep class or, or track or were you on the career mm -hmm. English? Okay. I figured. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was. I mean, so if I go, if I go back, I, I was a socially anxious teenager and okay. it's ironic because I ended up studying social anxiety for my dissertation research nice. and was like, oh, that explains a few things. <laughs> Nice. But in, in hindsight, as a socially anxious teenager, so, so uh, social anxiety is just defined by a fear of judgment. So I was this insecure right. teenager who desperately wanted to be popular. I wanted to fit in. And I had friends and um, could perform and I was a good student. But I also have a really rare vision impairment. And so I'm legally blind and I always have been. But at that point in time, I could, I was able to drive back then. So really I worked super hard to fake being normal because right. no one wants to be different in that kind of way, right? Like right, you right, want right. to be special, but you don't want to be different in a bad way when you're a teenager, right. especially not when you're already socially anxious, which meant one of those voices in my head was you're not good enough. They're better than you are. Right. If people know about your vision, they're going to reject you. So right. I hid that I was on the dance team and, you know, performance was fine. Cause that wasn't me, right? Like I could perform just fine, but having like conversations like me talking to you, that's where all of those insecurities would really pipe up. Right. Okay. But it was a smart, smart kid. And, right. you know, so it was like, you're going to go to college and I did. Right. And honestly, my anxiety made that decision. I didn't know it at the time. It's like hindsight, uh, because there were other schools I was really interested in, but I was frankly too scared to go out on my own, like to move to Florida or Texas. I've, I lived in Arkansas. And right. so I went to the college that offered me a scholarship because my mom filled out the application and forced me to sign it. She was like, sign this application. You are going to college. And I thank her 
every day for having the wisdom to push me. <laughs> Good um, for her. Right. Right? I yeah. know. Because then, you know, I get there. And th- this was what we used to call it Arkansas High, the the college years. Um, this is like back in the day when there was Saved by the Bell and then Saved by the Bell <laughs> college years. There was like a lot of people from my high school went to this college. Okay. So it wasn't even really a fresh start. I kind of hung out with people I already knew. And right, right. I got so lucky that I, well, I majored in psychology for two reasons. It was between that and math. I couldn't work the calculator. It was one of those big fancy TI something or other calculators. I couldn't even get numbers to come up on the screen. And I was too embarrassed to ask the professor for help. Uh. So I was like, I guess I'm now a psych major. (laughs) So I was a psych major. So I I love it. I did a a bachelor's degree in psychology. I learned a lot, mostly that I didn't want to do psychology. (laughs) Okay, that's fair. I mean, it also happens like psychology was the only subject that I didn't fall asleep reading. Like I just. It's it's thoroughly interesting. I would say it's like the, the whole time that I spent like going to those psychology courses, it was Mm -hmm. great. I mean, like, it's amazing. You learn about all the psych, basically, you know, like getting a a bachelor's of science, you know, this. Uh I'm, I'm telling the world here is like, they're just telling you like the history of like, this is what Freud thought. And this is what Carl Rogers thought. And this is what this guy thought. And, and then you get to the end and they say, okay, what do you want to do? Right. You pick one of these guys and yeah. you focus on that and then you go get a master's or a PhD. And yeah. I went, nah. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> but <Yeah>. thanks though. <laughs> well, and that because you really don't do much with a psychology degree right. unless you've gone to grad school, right? Exactly. And yeah, yeah. It I yeah. Get, it's just like the bachelor's degree is just marketing for the next thing. <laughs> That's a yeah, I think you're absolutely right yeah. on that one. And yeah, so you, you, know, you then, actually picked one and you went for it. Good for you. Well, I did. And, and yeah. part of that was, I mean, I was a perfectionistic kid, right? Like sure. that's part of being socially anxious and be perfect. And yeah, yeah. I got so incredibly lucky that I got invited to join this, I guess it was like a club called the, called the Freudian Slips, which stood for searching for life in a PhD school. Nice. And it was the <laughs> psychology professor who took some psych majors who had good GPAs basically and sort of mentored us to be competitive for graduate school. And oh, wow. okay. that was hugely that's, all luck, that's, yeah, right? Right. Wow. I had no good idea. Like I stumbled into a lot of this, to be honest. And, and it ha- it's been very fortunate, but was, again, smart kid did well academically, but there's to get into clinical psychology, which is where my grad degree is. It's a very competitive field and there's right. not a chance I could have done this without Dr. Lammers. Right. And I wouldn't have gone to that group, except that was the other time my mom strong armed me. She was like, sign this application, <laughs> melted down on campus and was like, I can't be here. And she bribed me with a pair of linen pants from Banana Republic. Wow. She was like, I will buy these pants for you if you agree to go to school for a semester. And I was like, fine. I really wanted these pants. <laughs> and then she made me go wow. to, like jo- agree to join the slip. So then all of this was just, I was too shy to do it. So I did. You were and rooming. Then, you were definitely rooming. You were an autopilot. Much. You're rooming. And you're just like, I don't want very to, much. but whatever. I want the pants. I get it. Yeah. yeah. And and like, I, I think that, we I all have that kind of moment. Like I, most oh, of yeah. the good stuff that I did in the military came from supervisors, bosses, commanders all these guys saying, no, 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 go do it. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm just like so yes. grateful because I wouldn't have, right. I tried to drop out at semester cause like my roommate moved out. So I was like, going to live with a stranger and I freaked out. And again, it's like, mom, I'm coming home. And she pulled this, where are you going to live? I'm like, oh, with you, obviously. She's like, how are you going to pay rent? I'm like, well, I'll, I'll get a job. How are you going to get there? And I was like, well, I'll drive. And she's like, whose car are you going to drive? That's my car. <laughs> and so all of this, and I finally was like, well, I can't afford wow. to come home. She was like, I guess you better stay there. And my mom is not, she's not hard like that all the time, but it was just, I mean, we've had these conversations now, like knowing what I know now about anxiety and psychology and all that, I have thanked her profusely. And she was just like, I knew you needed to do this. You were smart. You needed to do this. I wanted you to have opportunities and eternally grateful. But with that, but I she ended wasn't up wasn't gross about it. <laughs> no, no, it was just these moments of like, she was really, <laughs> right. yeah, she wasn't gross, but she was, forceful and, and not accommodating in a way that like she, basically yeah. the way I see it is she forced me to be brave when I didn't know how. 
And gotcha. you yeah, know, yeah. when we yeah. fast forward to where yeah. I am now and the stuff I like to talk about, I'm like, dang, mom. She's that like was your kung fu sensei, basically. Exactly. Yes. She's whacking yeah. you with a stick when you need to be whacked with a stick. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's and great. so thanks, mom. Yeah, I'm I'm so grateful for that. And you know, I go through undergrad and then of course you can't do anything in psychology unless you go to grad school. Right. So I went and I liked clinical because I liked learning about the disorders and I wanted to help people. So I was like, cool, I'll just do clinical psych. Somehow I got into a fantastic program. I was really lucky, actually, again, because I was an alternate, which means someone else turned down a spot at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And so I got in. And wow. it was wow. So it just worked out so well because I got in, and the way it works is you get accepted into a professor's lab to do research with them. And then you go through the training program. But right. the professor that I um who accepted me, she studied adolescent social anxiety. And then I start reading and I start wow. learning about social like, anxiety. Hey, wait a minute. This sounds familiar. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> this is kind of like my it. life. <laughs> exactly. Like in the in the joke in psychology is it's not research, it's me search, which was very much the case for me because right. I was like, wow. Oh my god, this explains so much. So then I start learning about social anxiety and how to treat it. I start then uh, that was also one of the first times that I was surrounded by other people like me, like nerdy people and so I really kind of got to thrive in that element. And so let, started, let, me, let me ask mm -hmm. you a question. When you say nerdy, yeah, what do you mean? Because people have lots of different like connotations when they say yeah. nerdy. So I think my guess is like, you just want to test things and be scientific. That is it completely. Okay. Yeah. Good. I, I live <laughs> okay, life good. by experimenting. It's not like, you're like reading anime all the time. That's I a nerd, no, right? I don't do anime. I love I love epic fantasy. Like give me a Brandon Sanderson novel any day. Okay. But no, when I say nerdy, I mean science. Science. Like, science. Yes. Don't data. believe it. Test it. <laughs> Bingo. Like that is honestly one of my biggest mantras now. Yes. I, I like don't I live it. through test experimentation. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Right. Exactly. I like it. So, okay. So you're yeah. with your nerds and sorry, yeah. I interrupted. <laughs> no, that's great. And then that's like some confidence started coming, right? And like some right. of that like social anxiety came down, but still very honestly shameful about my vision. So it was still like this dirty right. secret, very Ooh, few yeah. people knew right, about. Right, right. Um, and I could fake it. Well, I had a really good memory, very studious. So I could, you know, really fake site. And, right. but like the confidence in, in every other area was really going up. And then, you know, right. I graduate and I take a job and then I end up moving to Kansas city to work at an anxiety clinic. Uh, cause that's my area of uh, sure. clinical expertise is right. not just social anxiety, but all of the anxiety disorders, because one, it, it's super common too. It makes sense. Like I like understanding the brain and how the brain works. And we know a lot about anxiety in the brain. And then it's like, when mm -hmm. you know that, there's these, it's like you can hack the system. And then I right. get to work with cool, awesome, amazing, smart people who just have busy brains and nervous systems and they get better. So mm. I love that. Yeah. So I moved to Kansas City, which was like a risk, right? Because I was I was working in Omaha at the, at the children's hospital there. I had like moved back for a relationship that didn't work out and then was just sort of kind of rooming, right? I was like here on autopilot. I right. met this woman who ran the clinic in Kansas City at a conference in New Mexico, I was like, yeah, I'm not really happy. I think I'm going to look for other jobs. She's like, come work for me. And I laughed. And then she was like, no, I'm serious. Come work for me. I'm like, you haven't even seen my resume. But she saw me speak at that conference. And huh. so I, I upped and moved to Kansas City. And it was a really great move for me. I, um, Yeah, it was, it was great professionally. I was mm. loving what I was doing until I hit a point where things weren't really kind of working anymore. And, and for me, this is where um, like – you, you can fake sight to a point, but my vision, the, my particular brand of vision loss is degenerative, meaning like every so often it just gets worse. And uh, it progressed to the point where I had to stop driving. Like I'm not safe to operate a car anymore. And that for me was this huge like crisis moment, turning point, because all of a sudden- it's suddenly becoming part of your identity that you are- bingo. Blind, basically. Yeah. Right. And like, and you can't, I can't fake it anymore. Right? right. So it was like, I had to, I was like forced out of the disability closet and I was freaking terrified because yeah. who will I, I was, be if I am yeah. a blind person? You don't want to right? Go, right. Where that Absolutely. Well, and right. I was so convinced that I wouldn't be able to be independent. 
I wouldn't be able to be successful. Like I'm ambitious. I have big goals professionally. I was like, my patients aren't going to want to work with me. I can't do my job. And, right. and I don't do things the way I did back then. I used to do in-home therapy and community-based stuff. Like you have to be able to be mobile for that. Right. But so I, and then I was convinced people wouldn't even want to be with me, like in terms of personal relationships. Like, so I really, right. and then I think ultimately fully believed hook, line and sinker that blindness equals misery, that I was just looking at this miserable future wow. and I wallowed. Right. So I had to stop driving. And so I, you know, then I came out to like my boss and my mm. coworkers and my patients at the time. Wow, and you're coming out, you're saying, Hey, Oh, yeah. oh by the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, because like, oh, by the way, now, right. Uh, I mean, how, most many, of my how patients, many people like knew anyway, already? not a lot, not a lot, not a lot. Well, like maybe a handful. You were really well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And like, I mean, I had to use like a telescope device to drive and I like would not let anyone see that. So I just never drove if someone else was with me. Okay. So I would talk wow. about it, but right, like right. not the full extent of it. And like yeah. none of my patients knew. And so, and, and even now people are still surprised sometimes because depending on what context you interact with me, mm. you can't tell. And I, my right. doctors call me well adapted and I'm like, nah, I was scared. So I faked it, but <laughs> I am adapted. You, know, you, and, you would be surprised how many people are faking it all the time and not right? letting on. And, yeah. Yeah. And there's like a, like my mom has got like, I don't know what to call it, but you know, she's mm -hmm. like 86 with like dementia, mm -hmm. but, but I don't really want to say anything other than that because it's just mm -hmm. a symptom, but everybody knows. Right. Mm -hmm. But she is increasingly trying to like play it off all the time. Oh, we do. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just what, you know, there's, and it's not like you can like tell her because you tell her and, you know, A, she would forget. <laughs> not fair. Fair. Right. You could tell yeah. her every day and she wouldn't remember the next day. Yeah. Right. So what's the point, right? You just right. love her anyway. And, you know, I, yeah. I you kind of have to learn. Right. But my point is, is like people that have stuff like this, like mm -hmm. blindness, dementia, whatever they're hiding. Right. And they're faking like a lot. Well, we all do. Right. And it's, yeah, me it's too. right. We all it really do. boils down to it, it's shame, which is a, like a variant of fear. It's a fear of disconnection. Right. If, right. if I just stole from Brene Brown and, and that's it, it's this deep down. If people knew this about me, they wouldn't accept me. So we right. hide that in so right, many right, ways. Right. We're right. busy. We put forth successful images. We hide things that have happened to us in the past. Like right. there's all of this stuff. And I am very grateful that I was forced to confront that because it is the only way to really uh, yeah, overcome that. Yeah, you can't live that way. No. I mean, and, it, it has and a cost. I mean, absolutely. obviously you can, but it's not healthy. <laughs> it's not happy for it's sure, healthy, right? And that's, it's not happy, right. But it's like, you can't, and you're right, like you can't tell people that, right? I remember one of my best friends and she was a, a grad school friend and a brilliant psychologist, but we were, you know, we were in our like mid twenties. And I remember we were walking on the campus of the VA where she was working and I was saying something and she looked at me and she was like, well, you're adhering to the faulty belief that you're flawed. And my response was, well, I am flawed. Mm. And that was just, and, and so I could see it. Like she was saying, we don't judge you for your vision. Your vision is like such a small part of you. It does not make you less than, but right. someone telling you that is very different than experiencing it. Right. It's like, if right. you were going to teach me how to play the flute, you wouldn't tell me you'd put a flute in my hands and show <laughs> me how to do it. Right? right. 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 Well, it's the same thing when it comes to this. So when I stopped driving and I couldn't fake it anymore, I had, you know, I had to start telling people and then I like, I put my story online to, to raise money for the foundation fighting blindness. And and I sent it to everybody in my email contacts and I put it on social media and then I proceeded to go fetal in the floor and like sob because I was like, I'm going to throw up. My life is over. Everybody knows. And it was this wow. horrific awakening. Right. And you know, I called my mom and she's like, honey, I'm really proud of you. And the partner at the time was fully supportive. So he knew. And, and then like the weirdest thing happened, like nobody judged people would, you know, start helping. They were like, oh, I had no idea. I've known you 10 years and I didn't know this about you. And I'm like, cool. I was really into ballroom dancing at the time. And we had this big event coming up and I'm like me walking into a ballroom by myself and trying to find my people is like my nightmare. Cause I can't see people's faces. Right. So I'm like, can you wave at me? And it was just this outpouring of people not judging. So basically right. it was me right. proving my mind wrong. Uh -huh. And then somewhere in the mix of this, because I'm a nerd, I was like, I got to like, 
I, I can't change my vision, but I don't want to be miserable. I'm going to go to science and specifically science of happiness. So I started like reading everything I could get my hands on and looking at it. And I science came across of happiness is, is a game changer, right? Yeah. It's a, but it's this, we all want it and we have such misguided notions about how even to get the de- it. Even the, de- the definitions don't work out, right? You Agreed. say you want to be happy and then, right. and then, and then you go, well, what the hell is that? Right. And, and it's different, you know, and you kind of have to make up stupid words. So Arthur C. Brooks says Uh you can't actually be happy all the time, but you can get happier every day. Yes. You can so get I, a little bit happy. So he, he says, uh, we're working on happy earnest. <laughs> I love that. So I, I love yes. his take on stuff right. though, right? Me too. Like, yeah. Um, He's great. I, I had the good fortune of seeing him speak at TEDx oh, wow. Kansas City a couple okay. years ago. Yeah, yeah. He's and a great speaker. Yeah. He's a great speaker. And yeah. very he was chill. Talking about, he's got a great vibe. Yeah. Right. But he's, he's want- so insightful. And he was yeah. talking about how like, no, you can't be happy forever. And if you're chasing happiness, like right. there's this process. You're chasing called- anything. Yeah. The, you Bingo. know, the chasing. Yes. Right. But, but right. We, there's this process called habituation, which is like basically going back to baseline. So think about it. Like if you get into a cold swimming pool and you mm. stay in it, you get used to the water, right? You right. habituate right, or get right, used right, to right, it. Right, right. As an anxiety expert, like I know that piece because that's what I do with my patients. I'm like, let's go face fears. That's what I did. I, right, well, right. I was forced to. But if you face your fears you get used to it and that's how you overcome it. Right. The same thing happens on the happiness side too. So if you like, I'm going to go get this ice cream from Betty Ray's, the, my neighborhood ice cream shop. Yeah. It's so good. The first couple of bites, but bite a thousand is not going to be that good. Right. You get used to it. So I loved, yeah. you know, um, Dr. Brooks talking about if you're looking at it, if you're chasing external sources, you're going to keep, you're going to get used to it. And then you have to go after something bigger. And in psychology, right. we call that hedo- the hedonic treadmill. That's how you end up chasing <laughs> yeah. higher and higher. And so right, right. I love it. Um, shameless plug here, but I, I published a book a couple months ago called The Way I See It, A Psychologist's Guide to a Happier Life. And yeah, it's sort of- it in there. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's blending of psychology and then the life lessons. But I have a whole chapter in there about seeing Arthur Brooks speak and what I learned from yeah. that and how- like the secrets to lasting happiness. Yeah, and yeah. so happier just... teacher. That's what I, I think. I, bet... I, I would love to be a happy, happierness teacher. That would be. I great. love that so much. Though. That's like <laughs> such a good word. But you know, to your point, it's so funny. When I was in grad school, my master's research was the link between happiness, anxiety, and, and social anxiety and optimism. Cause I'd found right. positive psychology back then, which is like the study of how do we get more of the good stuff. And I remember sitting at a village in, which is like a diner restaurant. Yep. That same friend who was like, you're adhering to the faulty belief. And then our other friend and, you know, I'm working on my master's thesis, the proposal for it. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to study happiness. They're like, cool. How are you defining it? And I got, I mean, I was so annoyed. They were asking great questions, but it's to your point. I was like, you know, happiness, we all know it. But if you're going to study something, if you're going to measure it, you you have have to be able to write it it. down. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And that was like my dipping my toe in of like, what is this elusive happiness thing? And then, yeah, 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 fast forward. Like we, Mm -hmm. we, and in in the constitution, we're pursuing it, which is also like this. That's, it's another word for chase. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, the pursuit of happiness, you know, and then that's different too, right? The chase, even from like a, this is the nerd coming out, but like that's, that's a dopamine kind of thing. Like brain chemicals, we're chasing that, which is different than contentment, which is serotonin. And so then we have this whole like, like, oh man, so much stuff here. Like the other day. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. I, so I'm like a big fan of. I don't know why I'm, I'm a weirdo in so far okay. as like when I want to recreate, I usually want to have things like smoking meat in my smoker for four plus hours when mm-hmm. the weather's nice mm-hmm. is like my happy space. Yeah. If there's people around, that's cool. But if there's just birds and lizards and wind and mm-hmm. yeah, and I, I learned something this last week is like. I used to like have the music on and maybe listen to a podcast and like, and I don't know why, but this last week I just like just stayed in the silence, you know, Mm. and it's not silent at all. Right. It's just not distracting. Right. I'm not, I'm, I'm baking in this like, like groove of, I'm just listening and I'm noticing like, wow, 
you know, my inverter for the solar panels. That makes a buzz. <laughs> That's but amazing. See, I, I would have never noticed that if I had a podcast going. Well, but I right? love what you're talking about, Jeff, because you're talking about being present. Yes. And you're talking, which noticing, noticing is a very, I'm present or mindful is the word that people, you know, it's right, a right, big right. buzzword. And when I first encountered mindfulness, I was like, I call BS, like as a psychologist specializing in anxiety, I call BS, minds don't go blank. And it turns out it was, I didn't really understand what mindfulness meant. Mindfulness right. is just paying attention to the present yeah, yeah, without yeah. judging it. Yeah. And now, like if people were to ask me, like, what does it take to really lead a happy life? This is part of it. The more time we are present, right. It doesn't really matter what the quality of the present moment is. Like I, I there's a whole other tangent we can go down of, I don't think hard is bad. I think we need to be uncomfortable. I think we need to embrace difficult, right. hard, challenging, and that frees up a lot of things too, but just being present and you know, part of it for me was starting a mindfulness practice when I finally kind of figured out what it is. And <laughs> right. sometimes that looks like meditation, but a lot of times it looks like what you're talking about is just right. walking with silence, which that took a long time because I used to be pot or I, I, I do more audio books and right. I still do that a lot. But sometimes it's nice just to be or dancing. You're very in the moment yeah. or I, one of my favorite things is like laying on a beach and alternating between reading and napping and meditating. And that right. is just, that's awesome. Yes. Reading, yeah, napping, that's and so, meditating. That's good. Yeah. It's so different than this. Like you got to go, 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 be busy, 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 totally. busy, which is right. right. I think what the our one feeds dictates. the other kind of idea, Bingo. but we don't do really do the, 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 you know, once you, if you can figure out, it sounds stupid, but how to enjoy that groove that you're talking yeah. about where you're alternating between, you know, like maybe Absolutely. you've got like this tiny little thing that you're saying you're doing. So you can say you're yeah. doing something, but you're really trying to do nothing. <laughs> right. Well, right. That's, just so being. many people yeah, are, being. well, it, it's being versus doing, right? right? There's that saying of like, we're right. human beings, not human doings. Right, and, right. but so many people are incredibly uncomfortable with either their own thoughts, their own mind. So they right. have to stay distracted because otherwise, and then that's where I'm like, if you understand how your mind works, mm. you can start to shape it and you can have a different relationship with it. Yeah. Silence isn't scary anymore. And then the other piece is because we right. are taught, at least in our culture, like we prize productivity. So there's this, if you're not doing something productive, yeah. then you're wasting your time. And yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. There was this viral post a few years back and it was like regrets of the dying. It was written by a person named Bronnie Ware, who is a palliative care nurse and talking about after talking with tens of thousands of people, these common themes, this is what people regret on their deathbed. It is not, I wish I had worked more. Or no I wish one I would have achieved more. higher, right? Yeah, right. it is. I wish right. I had let myself be happy. I wish I had been myself. I wish I had spent more time with the people I care about. And right. so- Sounds twisted, but been a I better think husband, a lot. parent, whatever. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, like yeah, I yeah. think a lot about like the how finite our time is. So it's like yeah. sounds a little morbid to be like I think about dying all the time. But in this it, way, no, of, I get it. I I understand yeah. what you're talking about. You have to know that that's that's a guarantee. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, I, and I don't want to have what, those regrets. What happens and... after is up to debate, but you will die. <laughs> exactly. That's I have seen yes. zero exceptions to that, and right. it makes me think then. Right about being intentional. Right. And right. so if I kind of go back like this point where I stopped driving and life sucks and I'm scared and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do science of happiness. I also then stumbled across a field called life design, right. which okay. is basically, I think it's sort of psychology adjacent, but it, it was founded out of Stanford university and um, it was design thinking. So it's like the way people approach designing products like the iPhone or the instant pot, but then applying it to life, which basically just means question assumptions be intentional about creating your life experience. And that for me, I felt like Neo in the matrix where I was like, yeah, yeah. You I woke don't up have in to... a vat of goo. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, <laughs> what does this do? And I don't have to go back. Right. Like I don't have to work a nine to five, 50 hours a week until I right. retire. I can start. And also then maybe I work until the day I die, but under different circumstances, or maybe I right. take retirements along the way. So it was that. And then kind of everything sort of coalescing into this, like what I'm doing isn't working. Yeah, I need to figure out how to, how to not be afraid anymore, how to you know, live a bigger life. I started to take chances. Like I started my own practice and 
then peak mind. And then, if, you know, it, it, to your point about experimenting, like that's a huge tenet from life design is try it out. Yeah. Like, so I, all the time will test stuff out. Like what mm. happens if I try this? What happens if I put this yeah. out here? What happens, you know, if the other I, mind virus mm-hmm. that bothers me that I haven't talked about yet, I'm going to mm-hmm. get, I want to get your take. It's yeah. like, there's this, like, I guess like meme, I don't know what it is, but like, if you're going to do something and you're not like the world's best at it, mm-hmm. then you suck. Mm. And, and if you start something, you have to finish it and you have to be like Olympic level or something. It's like, no, <laughs> Both yeah, of those, but none like, of those things are true, you know? Absolutely. And as a recovered, mostly recovered perfectionist, right? right? Like right, I right, see right. that because there's this idea of like, I don't, I mean, there have some, you know, writings in the book too on perfectionism, but it's this, I think sometimes perfection is, uh, it's an avoidance tactic. If I am perfect, no one will judge me. If I am perfect, I will yeah. not have to experience yes. failure. Right, if right, I am right, perfect, right. all of these things, right, right. if I'm perfect, then I'll be happy. And, and I'm nobody's like, no. perfect, So you're constantly hiding the little flaws. Yes. And yeah, then you're yeah, yeah. like, it's a rigged game and you're set up to fail. Like, <laughs> totally. Yes. Cause now it's, you, oh, that was, it turns out you're human. <laughs> right. I tell that to people all the time. And like, I had to learn know, that lesson the hard way too. Yeah. I have to learn it repeatedly. I still will often get stuck on like the, right. okay, I want this to be great, but I'm trying to really like fail fast bias toward action at right now. My current mantra is thinking about the thing is not doing the thing. Like just, just do, do it. The and, thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm getting yeah. better at like, well, let me try this. I want to start yeah. a business. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. But no one else does either. So yeah. and try just because it and- you try something like I try, mm-hmm. I bought a guitar and I played with it for a little while. And then I mm-hmm. went, now I'm done with that. I and a bunch so of people important. gave me shit. <laughs> it's like, why did you quit? You quitter. Right. It's like, because I'm done. <laughs> well, and that's, but that's different than like, I think the problem with quitting is if you hit a snag and you're like, I want to do this, but it got hard. I can't do hard things. And you quit Yeah, that you need to push through, but giving yourself permission, like I do this with books. There right. are so many books out there. And I read Anna Karenina without knowing how long it was because I was reading it digitally. Okay. And I get through all 9 million pages of it. And it was the most boring thing I've ever read. And then I vowed, I will never force myself to fit. Cause I just kept exactly. waiting for it to get good. <laughs> and I, I've been didn't. there. Yeah. 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 So you I'm, had to give your permission to quit a book. Yeah. Right, and and right. so, cause I know a lot of people who are like, oh, I read one book at a time. And if I have to plug through, I'm like, no, there was another book I started and I loved it. It was good. Right. And then it, it just went left and it got really awful. And I was like, I'm not I'm finishing out. it. I'm out. And it was yeah. such a freeing experience. Totally. Of, yes. You don't have to. There's a to difference that, in quitting and changing. You get to that point of, mm-hmm. of like, I don't care about anything that's happening in this book. Why yeah. are you reading it? <laughs> no. And then if you come it, back to like, you, time it, is a limited resource. If right. I'm giving it to this book, I'm not giving yeah. it to the things that matter. So. Right, right. Yeah. But that's you know, learning to I, play by like, different rules. You get, guitar is inherently hard, right? Yes. But I think if you like enjoy the effort, Mm -hmm. then it's worth it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't enjoy the effort, you're not required to play guitar. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Right. Well, that's, there's so much of stuff that we did. That's what like kind of this combination of psychology and life design did for me was made me really start to question what are the rules that I'm living by? What are the assumptions that I'm operating on of like, this is how the world works or this is how life works. Where did those come from? And are they yeah. real? And that's where right. we start testing. And like, yeah, yeah. it's hard to carve your own path or take a risk. Like uh, um, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, I decided to switch my practice to virtual. I had to do that during COVID, right? Because right. we all did. Right. And then I'm like, you know, turns out for someone with a vision impairment has a hard time seeing faces. It's so much easier to see people on a screen because I can magnify it. And then I'm like, oh, oh, I can see that you're about to cry in my uh-huh. office. I can't. And so oh, when wow. I went back to the office, I was like, oh, oh, I don't like this. And it right. took me a while to really, you know, get the courage to say, you know what? It's my practice. I'm going to switch it to virtual. And I did that because I wanted to do some other things too. I wanted to be able to travel. I wanted right. to spend time on a beach. And you can do that if you're not tied to an office. Uh, so anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I, to, to, to do it, I set it up in my head as I'm running an experiment for six months. I'm going to do this for yeah. six months. I'm yeah. going to gather my data. I lost no patience. 
So nobody really cared. It's not a good fit for everybody and right. or, or every issue. And I have a lot of friends and colleagues who don't like doing virtual therapy. I'm like, it right. works for me for a number of reasons. Right. After six months, I was like, cool. And I gave up my office. But I think That's we great. just have to experiment and try things and like really yeah. look at what are the rules that you're living by and who like says who and can yeah. you break this? It was I, I remember um this thing where you just said, like, where where do these rules come from? Where do we mm-hmm. learn these things from? Mm-hmm. One thing that I learned was uh while I was doing a IT gig mm-hmm. in an elementary school, I'm hanging out with I think second or third graders. And they're and mm-hmm. the teacher was getting them ready to go to like some sort of assembly where they mm-hmm. walk around and do something in front of parents, like sing or something. Mm-hmm. And she's teaching them, like uh, she's lining them up and saying, okay, now we're in front of the parents. Don't scratch your butts because mm-hmm. then you'll be embarrassed. Right. Mm-hmm. And I went, oh, that's where that came from. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like I, I was always wondering how we learned that. Right. Don't right. scratch I mean, your butt in public. We're, right. We're, we're taught all kinds of things directly and indirectly. Right. Like right. I grew up in the South and manners are drilled in like, yes, ma'am. No, like that's one word. Right. Right. Some of it I think is great and useful and I'll keep some of it, but a lot of it isn't right. And and I I think there's some, you know, as humans, we're inherently social creatures and goes way back to like caveman and woman days. If we weren't, if we weren't in a tribe, you wouldn't survive. Right. So we have things like embarrassment and shame and guilt, these emotions to kind of keep us in line right? so we can survive. But no one's died from embarrassment. No one's died from shame or guilt, right? So <laughs> right. it's like we have this, I don't know, I kind of think of it sometimes like we have these ancient biological machines mm. in a modern world, right? And so right. you have to figure out like what still serves us and what doesn't or like just because totally. you feel anxious doesn't mean you're going to die or that it's something bad is going to happen. It just means right. you're stepping out of your comfort zone. Yeah. I mean, and, shame mm-hmm. has to have a positive or it wouldn't stay around, but exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't be utterly shameless because there's a whole TV show about what you get. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but then we are taught so many things like to right. be ashamed of, or to be embarrassed about, or to right. feel, right, right. and that's where we all start to hide and pretend, and, but we all want true belonging and you can't right. get belonging if you're not being authentic. You have to test all those things. Like Bingo. you have to test all of that. Yeah. Right. Which that's also like, means you got to be willing to be uncomfortable. Right. Cause like, it's not fun to step out of your comfort zone, but right, it can be um, once you get there. But you gotta you gotta learn to to be uncomfortable to to do hard things. And I think right. there's this trade off of like comfort in the moment versus comfort long term. Like right, right, I, the long term. What are they? Bingo. Pleasure delayer. But I, I also like that whole thing about like what the um, neurologists or the mm-hmm. neuroscientists say about mm-hmm. dopamine. Mm-hmm. Like if you're gonna hit a button that says dopamine on it, like Mm -hmm. something that is really awesome, right? Mm -hmm. The harder you press on that button, the Mm -hmm. more the crash will be, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. That's something, it's like a teeter totter, right? That makes sense. Well, and then there's also, um, like dopamine shows up in like the anticipation of reward. It's the chase, Right. Okay, Not right, the right, actual. Right. right, right? right. So there's people now out there who are talking about, you know, cause dopamine is kind of like the hot the hot chemical right now. It's the hot topic. Yes. Yeah. But people are talking about like training yourself to, to like the effort. Right. So like you're talking about effort with guitar and I reward. Right. Yeah. yeah. And like, I think you can train yourself in that. Cause I mean, and I certainly have, that's my lived experience. Like I started working out with a trainer two years ago, her Emily, and she's wonderful. And it was like, I had a speaking event coming up that I just wanted to feel really confident in on stage. So I was like, cool, I'll go try this. So it was an experiment because I don't like to lift weights. It was two years ago. And it turns out like doing this was such a great thing mm. that I've just made it part of my routine. I've made it part of like, this is a priority in my life. But over the time, it's been interesting to watch how it went from like, oh, I hate this feeling of pushing because it's hard right. to now it's like, cool, what can I do? Right, right, can right, I bump right. this weight? Can I do this? And it's like, yeah, that if you learn, it's now like it's a skill reward. that you have to mm-hmm. hone. Yeah, yeah. Right. Bingo. Of liking yeah. the thing. <laughs> Yeah. Well, right. exactly. But it, yeah. but it's that trade off of like the process of moving toward a thing. Yeah. Instead of like the big 
shiny, blah, blah, right? Well, no, exactly. No, no. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But I think it's because it's, those it's, payoffs are always kind of short lived and a little bit fake anyway. It's like they are. Like you talk, I, I remember uh, Brett Favre when he won the Super Bowl said he felt mm-hmm. kind of empty. He was like, he thought he was going to feel different after he won the Super Bowl. Oh, a lot of yeah. People and say you that don't. after weddings. And, and yeah, you yeah. don't. It's just like, just, okay, it's like, all right, it's like an ordinary Monday now. Yeah. And I just but, won the Super Bowl. What? what yeah. <laughs> what's well, going but then on? We habituate, you know? right? You right. go back to baseline and then you got to chase the next bit. And I don't, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with chasing achievement, right? When we look right. at like the science of well being, achievement for its own sake does contribute to our overall well being, as does oh, like. Totally. Positive emotional states like pleasure or enjoyment, fun. But that's not the be all end all, right? Then we need engagement. That's the like being right. in the zone, being present. We need healthy relationships. We need a sense of meaning and purpose. There's right. all of these things, but I don't know. We, we kind of have this idea, like in our culture right now, it's good vibes only. So if I have any other emotion besides happiness, I'm doing something wrong. And I'm like, yeah, no, 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 like, no, 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 that's, no. Emotions it's like the weather, kind right? Of crazy. <laughs> It is. Well, it and it's like is. It is. emotions are going to come and go and they right. serve there's, a purpose. There's an ordinary up and down of life. Bingo. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like, what is that yeah. old? I think it's some proverb of like, basically sunshine all the time makes for deserts. Like I love right. when it's 75 and sunny, but it's got to rain sometimes. And totally. like, I like feeling happy and pleasurable, but you're going to have other emotions. And so yeah. we need that. But then we also have this whole idea that happiness is external, right? Like, right. Um, and I, I took this quote from Arthur C. Brooks, it, it, like happiness isn't getting what you want. It's wanting what you have. Totally. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and there's yeah. that different, like when we look to external sources of happiness, it will always be fleeting and then we can't control, right? right what happens. And so right, right, right. Yeah, I heard you this. Pin your hopes mm-hmm. on things that like are expensive or are sort of like just happenstance, right? They just, yeah. oh, look, that that happened. And I and it had nothing to do with me, but it was awesome. Well, th- you're just going to be waiting around. <laughs> Bingo. Or you're going to have the Brett Favre thing where you're like, cool, right. and now I'm back right, to right, the- right. I heard this, this podcast interview years ago with my um, co-founder at Peak Mind, Dr. April. She was interviewing a woman named Gerda Weissman Klein who survived the Holocaust. And this woman says, and right. I kid you not, she was like, no one ever talks about the good parts of the Holocaust. And I was like- what? There were good things? <laughs> and she wasn't denying the atrocities, right? right of like right, of right, life in the concentration right. camp. But her I want to know was, what she said. <laughs> yeah. What, well, she what talked about right. <laughs> she talked about the compassion of the other survivors, right? That her oh, okay. best friend in the camp, right. starving, finds a wild raspberry and instead of eating it, puts it in her pocket, saves it all day, smuggles it in, and gives it to Gerda. Oh, and my God. I mean, right, like I have chill right, bumps right, right. every time right, I tell right. this story, I get chill yeah. bumps. I've been telling it for six years now. And, yeah. but her point, or, you know, what I took from that is if she can find a bright spot in the middle of a concentration camp, no matter how bad my life gets, right. there are bright spots. And it's not to deny reality. She wasn't saying it wasn't that bad. It's she up. was saying it sucked and here was good. And so- yeah. For me, I wasn't always here. Like for a long time, vision loss for me was, I like I like to call it my cactus. It was this meme I saw on Facebook that was just because life gives you a cactus doesn't mean you have to sit on it. And I sat on my cactus. I know, right? <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> Isn't it? I'm like, I, I have a, a pattern of getting life-changing advice from a Facebook meme. But, um, and, you know, I sat on my cactus for a long time. And it was all of that stuff, that fear, that that convincing story my mind was telling me about how I was going to be miserable. That when yeah. I got lucky enough to stumble across things that sort of got me out of it. Now I get to see my vision is worse than it has ever been. Mm. There is no cure. I have no idea how it's bad it will get, get. better. Right. It won't get better. I mean, maybe they're doing really exciting things with genes and stem cells. So maybe there's treatment options down yeah. the road. You know, as of right Link now could probably maybe make you some bionic eyes at some, there point. we go. <laughs> right. There, maybe like, you, come you, on, I'll be cyborg. <laughs> right. Yeah. You could get some Teloxu tel- eyes from Dune. That would oh, be amazing. <laughs> um, Remember when, yeah. uh, what, what was it? There was a, a guy, Thor lost an eye and he found one and he stuck it in and it worked. So there we the go. Future, you might be able to get, some I could very eyes. well. Yeah. So then it would be interesting. There's always I have hope. To, right. <laughs> 
and I, then I'd have to think about it. Right. Cause like, right. this is Do so I much a part of that? who I am. Right. Would I go back to that? And I'm like, mm, right, right. maybe. Um, and would it be seeing, seeing, or would it be some weird kind of seeing, you know, yeah. there's always that sci-fi darkness that you got. I know, but maybe <laughs> I would with. probably have to experiment and try it out just to see. And, right. So yeah. your story about the, the, um, concentration camp room oh, yeah. of, uh, Victor Frankel, right? Oh, absolutely. Had, absolutely. So what, Man's search what, for meaning. Yeah. yeah. He found, um, he like cried with joy when he realized that he got a fish head in his, mm -hmm. in his soup, right? Usually yeah. it was just like bone broth that tasted yeah. fishy, right? And, yeah. And there was this chunk of fish head in there mm -hmm. and he just looked at it like, I'll be able to think so much longer today. <laughs> but, 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 right. but he's another one who very much like, and, and yeah. he sort of was a, one of the forefront of, of um, like existential psychology. What's right. the meaning of this? Right. What's the right. purpose of right. life? And right. What, right. what he observed was like the survivors, the people in the camp who had a sense of meaning, something bigger than them, right. they survived. Right. And that, when we look at modern theories of well-being, like meaning and purpose is one of them. We need to, like, right. I did not enjoy writing my dissertation at all. Was it's not, not the fun. kind of writing I like to do. It right. wasn't fun. It was horribly stressful. Would I do it again in a heartbeat because it was worth it, right? Wow. It was something that allowed wow. me to do what I do now. And right. that's what I think a lot of times when we look at happiness or things like that, like would I choose vision loss? No. no. Am I making the best of it? Yeah. I'm not yeah. sitting on that cactus anymore. And it's allowing me to find purpose, to find meaning, to mm. help other people yeah. through this. And I think that's a huge part, but it's not happy in the way people think of happy of pleasurable, fun, or comfortable. Right. Right. It's an, it's yeah. a, yeah, it's a newly defined happiness mm -hmm. kind of thing. Right? A happiness. Right. Yeah. And I think like, yeah. and you know, life, life is hard and we get to it choose is. our heart. That was another meme that, that kind of rocked my world is like, choose your heart, right? Like yeah. I choose either going to the gym and working out with Emily, or I can choose health problems, like one of the two, or right. I can choose to eat kale now. It's not like kale tastes good, but it's good for you. Or I can choose, right? So we, cho it's like, choose your heart. Do you want it hard right now? Or do you want it hard down the road? Yeah. Cause it will be hard at some point. And right, I'd rather right. be. At least you're choosing it. Yes. Bingo. Right. And not just like so many of us. Right. Wait, we for, just go, wait for some hard to show up. Yeah. And then we just like it. Right. float down the river till we have to, right. It is yeah. hard to be intentional. Uh, okay. So we're getting close mm -hmm. to wrapping up. There's okay. one thing that I want to say was okay. like, uh, Mr. Rogers was already brought up, but he's awesome. Mm -hmm. I actually yeah. saw him do a quote, right. Mm -hmm. And it was like, and this was, you know, like sixties or seventies. He's like, I just want to tell all the kids out there, you don't have to do something like earth shatteringly phenomenal. You just have to be you, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, uh, and I was like, thanks, <laughs> because the yeah. world will tell you, like, if you're not, you know, the next thing, right? Yeah. At a world class, whatever, right? Absolutely. You don't have to do that. You just have no. to be really good at being you. You know, yeah. Bravely I agree be completely. you. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I, I use the <laughs> phrase, be bold, be brave, be you all the time. Like, yeah. that's sort of this mantra. Like Nobody else can be you. You know, right. So, was that yeah. Audrey Hepburn who said that? it was somebody else who said there was something like, you know, know, be you. Everybody else is, is taken <laughs> something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Nobody yeah. else can be you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Amen. All right. Absolutely. So you are Dr. Ashley Smith dot com. And yes. you've got that other thing. So tell people how they can find you, connect to you and uh, read your book, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. So um, drashleysmith.com is a great way to right. find me. My book is linked there. My TEDx talk is linked there, all my socials. Um, on social platforms, it's at Dr. Ashley Smith. Um, that's a, a most active on LinkedIn right now. But okay. um, yeah, that's a great way to connect with me. Awesome. This has been a blast. Super fun. Thanks for having me. You have co-host vibes all over you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I like to talk, right? And if you get two talkers together, it's just a fun conversation. Yeah, that's right. That's so, right. Yeah. Well, this is a blast. Thanks again, Jeff. I really appreciate Smith it. And Smith. Two Smiths. Right? Look out, world. <laughs> Thank you so much. You have a good one. Thanks. 
Thanks for taking the time to ride along with us on another episode of Vroom Vroom Veer. For podcast info and show notes, be sure to head over to vvveer.com. That's triple V double E R.com. Man, that's fun to say. And we'll catch up with you next time here on Vroom Vroom Veer. Vroom Vroom Veer.